was in, or is inspired by Pastor Sam, a conversation that we had on. Um, oh, okay. Yeah, very good. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, so, um, I don't know if any, if anyone has watched or, um, watches The Chosen. Has, mm -mm. has anyone, um, mm -mm. no, 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 okay. <laughs> uh, well, it's a very popular show, um, that lots of, non-Christians and Christians watch. And so I wanted to um, talk about or so The Chosen. Should God's Chosen watch this show? Why or why not? That's the question I'm asking today. So the first question Oh, I see. Denise says that she's tried to watch a few of the episodes. <laughs> um, so Christians that uh, watch the show, uh, some people say, well, I know I, I'm not exactly sure what season it is in, but when it first started, um, it was um, received kind of well. And I know that as it progressed, some Christians would see some of the um, things that were wrong with the show. Like it was not biblically sound and um, they would start to point those things out in the later episodes. So it started out good, like, oh yeah, this could be used as a, an evangelism tool. But so the question is, can this show be used as an evangelism tool? And the answer is nope. Why? <laughs> because it's not based on the Bible. The creator, um, Dallas Jenkins, he partnered or he um, his financial backing comes mostly from the LDS church which is the the mormon latter-day saints um which is the mormon church and that is who funds or at first it was crowdfunded but now it's mostly um funded by the lds church so you're going to get an lds based um product they're not going to fund something based on the Holy Bible, the Bible that we believe in. Why would they do that? That doesn't make sense. <laughs> so, um, well, can't this show be watched just for entertainment? Okay, so it's not an evangelism tool. So can't we just watch it for entertainment? No. <laughs> Why would you do that? <laughs> it's not based on the Bible. And it has heretical teachings that are sub subtle and that's really dangerous like if you are watching something and consuming things those that are very subtle you can begin to think that way especially if it's not outright or very bold like those things can um, change the way that you view Jesus or view the scriptures. And that's not a good thing. Why would you entertain things that are false or use something false to be entertained? Well, okay, but it's not bad because I mean, it's teaching people about Jesus, right? No, didn't I just say that it's a false Jesus? <laughs> like it's not based on the scriptures. So if it is not scriptural, based on the scriptures, that is really, uh, that's not good. So we should not be 
consuming it. We should not be recommending it for others to watch, especially if we are trying to evangelize to someone because it is introducing them to a false Jesus. And we don't, we don't want that. So I wanted to start with this scripture, which is John 17, 14 through, <clears throat> 14 through 17. Uh, let me go back to this part. Um, <laughs> I always feel kind of, well, not, not really, but when I am teaching on something like this, um, I feel like the fun police, like <laughs> I'm taking away things that maybe um like uh oh well Christians can't have fun or we can't do anything that is fun and it, that's not true but we shouldn't be participating or um in being entertained by things that are heretical which unfortunately um the chosen is. So back to the scripture. I want to get a scriptural foundation. I have given them your word. Oh, so um, this is a little bit of background about this scripture. Um, this is a part of a prayer that Jesus is praying before he is crucified. And so he's praying for um, his disciples and um, also uh, he's praying for us as well. So I just think that this is really good because this is Jesus. He's praying for us. And this is part of the prayer. He says, I have given them your word, talking about the disciples and the world has hated them because they are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. I do not pray that you should take them out of the world, but that you should keep them from the evil one. They are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. Sanctify them by your truth, your word, is true so i wanted to kind of start with that because the word of god is true so if we always begin and end with the truth we can't go wrong when we begin to stray from that that's where we go wrong <laughs> And so the question is, how do we be in the world, but not of the world? And in order to answer that question, I have a quick little video, which hits. How can believers be in the world, but not of the world? We're going to answer that question. When we read of the world in the New Testament, we are reading the Greek word cosmos. Cosmos most often refers to the inhabited earth and the people who live on the earth, which functions apart from God. Satan is the ruler of this cosmos by the simple definition that the word world refers to a world system ruled by Satan. We can more readily appreciate Christ's claims that believers are no longer of the world. We are no longer ruled by sin, nor are we bound by the principles of this world. In addition, we are being changed into the image of Christ, causing our interest in the things of this world to become less and less as we mature in Christ. Believers in Christ are simply in the world, physically present, but not of it, not part of its values. As believers, we should be set apart from the world. This is the meaning of being holy and living a holy, righteous life to be set apart. We are not to engage in the sinful activities the world promotes, nor are we to retain the insipid, corrupt mind that the world creates. Rather, we are to conform ourselves and our minds to that of Jesus Christ. This is a daily activity and commitment. 
We must also understand that being in the world, but not of it, is necessary if we are to be a light to those who are in spiritual darkness. We are to live in such a way that those outside the faith see our good deeds and our manner and know that there is something different. I just wanted to pause it there for a second. So we must also understand that being in the world, but not of it, is necessary if we are to be a light. And I think that is key um, because we can't, like this is the reason why we are still here. We are to be a light to those who are in spiritual darkness. So this is the reason why Christ left us here. It's the reason why as soon as we don't, as soon as we are saved, he doesn't just, you know, snatch us out of the world. We are here to <clears throat> draw others to our light, to him. So um, in me saying that, we're supposed to be different <laughs> than um, the world. So we are to live in such a way that those outside the faith see our good deeds and our manner and know that there is something different about us. About us. Christians who make every effort to live, think, and act like those who do not know Christ do him a great disservice. Even the heathen knows that by their fruits you shall know them. And as Christians, we should exhibit the fruit of the Spirit within us. Being in the world also means we can enjoy the things of the world, such as the beautiful creation God has given us. But we are not to immerse ourselves in what the world values, nor are we to chase after worldly pleasures. Pleasure is no longer our calling in life, as it once was, but rather but rather the worship of God. Um, so to me, th this is saying um, we are not to immerse ourselves in what the world values. So the world values entertainment and being entertained and that's what the world the world loves to do that and i feel like sometimes we as christians um we value that a little too much and we go wrong and things like this like this tv show instead of um doing other things <laughs> ministering or I don't know any other thing that we can do we would rather um, use that time to be entertained um, and I think so let's go not to say that we don't need downtime and time for refreshing ourselves and rest and things like that but uh, it doesn't have to be watching a show that's not edifying Christ so this is um, this video is about 20 minutes um, and it talks about the Jesus that is being presented in the chosen. Uh, I think it does a good job of um, introducing or like giving scriptures that are the truth and then how what is being prayed on the show. True Jesus, the the false Jesus that's being portrayed. Oh, so far, are there any questions yet? Any comments about um, anything that has been presented?
Do you remember when I came out here a couple of years ago and I was talking about this great up and coming television show they were coming out with called The Chosen? Everybody around the world is talking about it and loves it. Guess what? I just saw a brand new project that they're working on. The same studio that brought us The Chosen, Angel Studios, is partnering up with someone new to create an incredible new animated film about the life of David, as in King David. I've been saying forever that we need to take back the media. We need to create and promote a media culture of light and life. That's what revival looks like. So this dream team duo of Angel Studios and this new production company have a vision to make an epic film with a powerful message that is going to be the most significant biblical animated film since DreamWorks made Prince of Egypt. They have the skill and the ability to do it. And the cool thing about this is that they're even giving all of us as viewers the opportunity to become owners in the project, just like they did with The Chosen. You can invest in the project and even potentially get a return on the project. Go to angel.com. I'm not getting paid one cent to say any of this. I'm just all in. I'm all in for the cause. I'm on the team for revival. Revival? Wow. A media culture of light and life. That's what revival looks like. Look into my eyes. Do you see fear? You come at me with sword and spear, but I come in the name of the God of Israel. And just imagine the quality of movie we could produce on David with the proper budget. We really believe that the strategy needs to be outside the Hollywood system. We are thrilled to be working with Angel Studios for distribution. The Chosen has generated hundreds of millions of views and tens of millions of dollars. We've already got $19 million of investments and need another $35 million to complete this project. We need your help to bring God's heart to the world through the story of David. This animated series for children will bring in millions of dollars for the Mormons. The Mormons have an agenda, and your children are their focus. Go tell it on the mountain. Coming, the Chosen's Christmas movie, The Messengers, was released in 1700 theaters nationwide. It sold out within a couple of days. My partner in crime, Daryl Eaves, is here. Hey, everybody. <laughs> Daryl Eaves, uh, ladies and gentlemen, one of our executive producers. Oh, process. it's so exciting to be here. I know. That's excited. <laughs> I know. Like, people are actually about to see this for the I, first time. I, I am so excited. I, I really am excited for everyone that's internationally been waiting. And it's here. It's here. Um, I just sent you a note like a, a couple minutes ago that I want you to read because I know this is very powerful on your heart. You've really had a passion from the beginning for this pro pro project to reach the younger generation. And so we got this note and I thought, Daryl, this is your heart. You need to read this. One. Okay, I'm going to read it. <clears throat> so we saw the Christmas with the Chosen tonight. My eight-year-old daughter said it was is touching to her. She told us that she had some big news to tell us when she got home. News that would change her life forever. Her words. We got home and she told us that she truly believes. <laughs> you do this to me every time. <laughs> <clears throat> she said that she was watching how Mary trusted God and how much that she must have trusted God in those scary moments. And it basically she could trust God too. That showed her how she could trust. She could, she could trust yeah. God. Yeah, I'm so emotional. I can't <laughs> even read. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> She said that she prayed and asked God to help her with her doubts. She said that she believes Jesus is her savior. I said that you, um, that, that many LDS folks and I uh, love the same Jesus. Uh, I still believe that. She said that she believes. I'm sorry, I wanted to say, he has done a few interviews and he said that of you uh, th so this is Dallas Jenkins, the creator of the show, and he said that um, the LDS Church and Christians they believe in the same Jesus. Jesus is her savior. I know this is why you're doing what you are doing, and just wanted to let you know. Thank you, Sarah Lewis, and I can tell you, Sarah, tell your eight-year-old daughter. This is the reason why we're doing it. We can't wait for the whole world to see this. We can't wait for um, everyone to see The Chosen. And we really do want a billion people to be impacted just like your daughter.
for sure. Which Jesus is this little girl being led down the path to believe in as her savior? Is it the Mormon Jesus or the Jesus of biblical Christianity? Apparently, there's no distinctions with Dallas Jenkins and Daryl Eves. Or is it the Jesus of the chosen, the one that entertains, the ecumenical Jesus, the one that everybody loves? What's been so beautiful about seeing the show grow like it has, is you've got Catholics and Jews and Mormons, or again, I'm sorry if I use the wrong term, and evangelicals. We're all loving the same show. And this show is about Jesus. And it's an accurate portrayal of Jesus, I believe. So maybe, just maybe, we love the same Jesus. And ask yourself, did this little eight-year-old girl genuinely hear the gospel? And would Daryl Eves ever tell the audience of The Chosen that Mormons believe that a child on their eighth birthday reaches the age of accountability? Mormons believe that a child is born without a sin nature, but on their eighth birthday, the clock is ticking and now they are accountable before God. And to be a true believer in the Mormon faith, you must be baptized and confirmed in the Mormon church where they confer the Holy Ghost upon you by the power of the Melchizedek priesthood. Tell your eight-year-old daughter, Sarah, that that's nice that she believes in Jesus as her savior, but our third article of faith as Mormons is we believe that through the atonement of Christ all mankind may be saved by obedience to the laws and ordinances of the gospel, the Mormon gospel. Second Nephi 25, 23 says, says, for we know that it is by grace that we are saved after all we can do. Tell your daughter she's going to have to get busy with the gospel of works. And also tell her that although you can't see my temple garments underneath my black t-shirts I always wear, I learned secret handshakes and passwords that will one day take me through the veil and get me into my celestial glory where I can become a god. And this is Joseph Smith's restored gospel. None of these things are being disclosed to the Chosen's audience. Don't be afraid. The Chosen's Christmas movie earned 13.5 million in eight days. People must know. It was number four at the box office. Is this the Jesus portrayed in The Chosen that this little eight-year-old girl should commit her eternal destiny to? Blessed are you, Lord our God, King of the universe, who gives forth bread from this earth. And I pray that if there are ever two children who come visit my home here, that you will give them the courage Stay. to say shalom, Stay. so that they will know they do not have to remain in hiding. He's a good man. Stay. Amen. We need to go. Stay. We are going to stay. Yeah. <laughs> What's that sound I hear? Sheep don't sound like that. No, oh, that's definitely not sheep. Maybe a rooster? Greetings, children. Did Jesus draw the little children to himself in such a crude and juvenile manner? Is this the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords? The one who said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. I felt like God was saying, like, this is going to be the definitive portrayal of my people. And this is what people are going to think of around the world when they think of my people. And I'm not going to let you screw it up. Um, episode three is the one episode that I wrote by myself. <laughs> you want things to be fair. When someone wrongs you, you want to right it. And you know who else loves justice? But what does the Lord say in the law of Moses about justice? And vengeance. Vengeance is mine. Yes, very good. The Lord loves justice. But maybe it is not ours to handle. And God says he will have compassion on his people when... What? When their strength is gone? Yes, very good. So, maybe we let God provide the justice. Hmm? Maybe we handle these things in a different way. Not trying to be the strongest all the time. Even Messiah? You will have to see. 
Romans 12 verse 19 says, Dearly beloved, avenge not yourselves, but rather give place unto wrath. For it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, saith the Lord. Also Deuteronomy 32 35 and Psalm 94 very clearly say that vengeance is the Lord's. And this is not open for suggestion, like maybe we let God handle it. Matthew chapter seven, verses 28 and 29 says that the people were astonished at Jesus's doctrine, for he taught them as one having authority and not as the scribes. Maybe we let God provide the justice. Maybe we handle these things in a different way. Maybe it is not ours to handle. Fish, wine, what will be next? Any suggestions? Anything and everything. Let's do this. I'll go with you to the ends of the earth. I hope so, Simon. But I seem to remember there was a problem. Something about Andrew's feet. Andrew's feet. But first we must evaluate, no? No, 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 I can't. I think we have to. No, 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 I can't. <laughs> <laughs> Are there some things that Jesus cannot do? Dallas Jenkins, when interviewed about this, says it's just a joke. Luke 137 says, For with God nothing shall be impossible. Matthew 19 26, With God all things are possible. Was the incarnate God the one who opened the eyes of the blind and raised Lazarus from the dead, unable to heal Andrew's feet? And by the way, nowhere in the scripture does it mention Andrew having a problem. Uh, what audacity for Dallas Jenkins to think that he can joke about this. This is not funny. This is blasphemy. What about a person who has never read the Bible? What conclusion would they come to? Something even I cannot do. <laughs> it's as simple as... Well, okay. Uh, there was one other part that I wanted to show an interview that Dallas did. For many of the fans of the show The Chosen, it has created somewhat of a dialogue. And also, we're not just going to examine that, we're going to show you why we care. Why we care that he is telling people you are not a member of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, which the majority of our audience are members of the church. And so for you, I have been told that you are a fierce defender of the Latter-day Saint belief in Jesus Christ. And that is something that honestly, like for, on behalf of all of us, I just want to say thank you for that. But why is it that you are, are a defender of our belief in Jesus Christ? Great. So you're starting off right out, right out of the gate with, you know, with the tough, the, the the question. I I'm happy to to answer that, and and I just say that because I I recently have gotten a little bit in trouble in, in, in certain circles because I was on an, on another LDS podcast, and I I said that LDS and evangelical love the same Jesus, and I got some heat from from people who suddenly didn't want to. Apparently, it's a controversial statement, which I guess I would have known that a few years ago. But now that I've been working with my uh, LDS brothers and sisters over the last couple of years and gotten to know them so well, I've, I've learned quite a bit. And I, I come from a strong evangelical background. And there, I want to I want to say this, and I and I, I've said this on a few conversations with LDS people that. There, there are reasons why I'm an evangelical and not LDS. I do have things theologically that I disagree with or things that even just in kind of practice that aren't quite my speed in the LDS faith. However, one thing that is 
unabashedly true and unarguably true is that in getting to know some of my LDS friends here on this, especially through The Chosen, you're passionate about Jesus Christ and it's Jesus of Nazareth. And I, when I hear people say it's a different Jesus, and I've heard that, by the way, from both, I don't know what term, I know you guys don't use the term Mormon anymore, but it's too it's too uh, long for me to try to say. Go I'm ahead, you're fine. Jesus Christ of Latter-day <laughs> Saints, so I'll just say LDS, but uh, or LDSers, but I've heard it from both sides. I mean, I've, I've gotten criticism from the LDS church people who are uncomfortable with the show done by an evangelical. I've gotten criticism from evangelicals for working with people in the LDS community. So it, it has gone both ways. The Chosen has been, for me, a, a desperate attempt and, a, and an obsessive attempt to introduce people to the authentic Jesus of Nazareth. And in whatever way I'm doing that through the show, by using some of the people around him and telling their stories through our devotional book, all of these, my wife and I are obsessed with The Chosen being a vehicle for people to be introduced to the authentic Jesus. I just wanted to stop there. He used the word obsessed a few times. And the when I heard that, the first time that I was watching this, it really stuck out to me. I was like, upset? That, that just did not sit right <laughs> with me. Like, And so I looked up the word obsessed. Obsessed is an adjective. The first meaning is having or showing excessive or compulsive concern. And they give, a, there's a simile or like a another meaning or another word that um, can be used for obsessed, which is haunted. But the second definition is what um, made me like pause. The second definition is influenced or controlled by a powerful force such as a strong emotion. And the simile or like the um, same word that can be used is possessed. And I was thinking to myself, well, are you obsessed or are you possessed? with trying to describe or like show this Jesus of Nazareth is the question. Because that that just didn't sit right with me. Um, so uh, I want to, I'm gonna end the video portion and close out with, there's a lot more but I don't want to go over <laughs> my time limit. Um, so I just want to end with the scripture, of course. Um, so the, the scripture that I'm ending with is for if he who, uh, Second Corinthians 11, 4, for if he who comes preaches another Jesus, whom we have not preached, or if you receive a different spirit, which you have not received, or a different gospel, which you have not accepted, you may well put up with it. So if it's a different Jesus than the Jesus that's in the Bible, we should not be partaking of that Jesus. Um, any questions or comments? I have one. Yes, ma'am. In, in the video clip that you showed, he was saying that he was trying to introduce people to the authentic Jesus, and that's what really stuck out to me. Sure. But in his movie, the clip that you showed, Mm -hmm. He had his Jesus mm -hmm. saying that um, even there's something even he can't do. Mm -hmm. So if he's introducing an authentic Jesus, why would he put that and make it a joke in his movies that he's trying to reach people with? Because he's not teaching them the truth about Jesus. And that's the one thing I'm like, why is he's contradicting himself? 
it's like he still want to be a Christian, but he wants to be. And to me, it seems like LDS is converting him over. They're they're slowly pulling him in. I don't think it's a slow thing. I <laughs> don't think he is a Christian. I just don't understand why he doesn't say that I am in the LDS church. Yeah. Like what? But I, I feel like it is a way to pull Christians away from their faith. Like, oh, because he's a Christian, so it's safe. We can we can safely watch this program. So it's okay to consume this program because it is under the tutelage of a Christian. And a Christian wouldn't let um like things that are not Christian be in the in the TV show, right? Mm -hmm. Yes. That's kind of how I was drawn to it at first. That's why I said I tried to watch it, sure. but I just I don't know what, but it just ain't right. Like I said, and you know yeah. that I, it's Christian, but then yeah, I just couldn't follow through with watching it. So, what can I ask, um, Denise? Why did you stop watching it? You know, I'm not sure. I just couldn't hold my. <laughs> it didn't hold my attention, and it seemed too like watching another. Uh, when you were saying of the world, it just didn't hold my attention. What I thought it would be. Mm -hmm. did you watch it for the entertainment value or did you watch it hoping that it would draw you closer to Jesus or I to was hoping it would draw me closer to Jesus mm -hmm. and when I and I what Sharina just said I kind of got sucked in saying oh good they're having Christian entertainment because it's so hard for to find <laughs> anything I think that's it. what they were hoping oh. it would do right. and yeah, but for some reason, I never got past um, maybe two or three episodes, and I kept trying, and I was, like, rewinding, and it, it just didn't connect, mm. you know, so I just kind of gave up. The, the, the Mormons, we've done um, a lot of studies on Mormon religion, comparing it to Christianity in the past, and there's just so many things that are uh, not a uh, Christian period in the, in the well they're another sect they don't they're not really Christians they're Mormons they just are like, a cult they are like not Islam. <laughs> right they're <laughs> like okay you got Hindu you got Christian you got Islamic so it's another sect you got uh, uh Catholicy so it's not so it's one of a different sect from us all together was invented or founded by Joseph Smith yeah you know, that was the founder. And then he laid down all of these strange laws for them. Uh, they kind of touched on the uh, the uh, the magic clothes. They wear clothes under their clothes, mm -hmm. uh, especially the, the men. Uh, they, I mean, this is not religious one way or the other. They can't drink coffee uh, or tea or anything like that. They believe in polygamy. They believe they can have more than one wife. They don't believe in the Trinity the way that we do. Uh, they believe in the baptism for the dead. So there's a lot of strange things that are uh, underlining in their religion that Christians should just stay away from. So when you look at a, uh, you, you looked at it and you figured it out that something's wrong. Well, just think about, and uh, that's what Sharina said at first, and I think, uh, yeah, she said uh, a new Christian or a new believer or someone who doesn't know the Lord and looks at it, and they get this picture of all of these wrong things in their head that this is the way Christianity is supposed to be. So that's the scary part. For us old folks who've been in the Word for a while, We there's so many triggers in it that will make us say, hey, this is this is not right. But for a new person looking at it and they don't uh, have a knowledge of the word of God, they'll be suckered in. I'd like to say one other thing too. He, if he is an evangelical, 
and not telling the Mormons that they don't will die and go to hell if they don't change their religion, then he is doing them a great disservice also. That's a money thing. Mm -hmm. I mean, when you bottom line, it's a, it's a money mm -hmm. thing. One of the other things that Mormons believe is Jesus and Satan are brothers. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, like, yeah, there we we got two different Jesuses. Because <laughs> mm -hmm. the Jesus that I believe in is not he created Satan. He didn't. He's not his brother. Mm -hmm. And it's like, so. It's and it's so scary that, you know, they're talking about millions and millions of people have watched this. They're trying to get to a billion and all of that. That is really scary. Mm -hmm. When you think about how many Christians are watching it and being entertained and taking it as truth. My word is truth. You gave us that scripture. Mm -hmm. My word is truth. And if we're not looking at his word, you know, in anything, we're looking at something false and fake mm -hmm. and not of God. That was good. That oh, was it was the last thing, and then I, I'm finished. <laughs> um, I thought that it was interesting how uh, th the reason why I wanted to show the first video is they are targeting the children just like uh, everyone else. Right. <laughs> like everyone is targeting children because mm -hmm. the, everyone knows that that's the like. Well, it's not everyone. It, Satan is targeting the children in many different ways. Mm -hmm. So yes. that's the, that is the thing. And that should make all of us go evangelical Christians very, very spiritually mad. Instead yes. of just watering it down, we should, we need to go back to preaching fire and brimstone. You know, that's called a spade a spade, whatever you want to say. What that, that that's that angel of light syndrome. Anything that looked a little bit close to Christianity, that'll keep Christians away from having any kind of power and authority in Jesus' name when they dealing with those Mormon folks. You know, you know. What you need to do is that do the contact with the Masons and the Mormons and satanic worship. They almost got the same rituals. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they got a lot of the hands, hand rituals. Handshakes and rituals and stuff that they do in the temple. At one point, they wouldn't let people of color in their temple, you know. Yeah. yeah that's, so that's all that I have. That mm -hmm. Unless there are any other comments or questions, um, mm -hmm. Sister Linda. You can move on to your part. It's very good to hear your perspective on it, Denise. Thank you. Yes. Won't finish watching it. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Good evening, everybody. My presentation is on the Cashless Society and Biblical Prophecy. Because we've been talking a lot um, about the credit cards and the debit cards that we have. Um, mm -hmm. So a cashless society gives the government complete control over your finances. And such control is clearly described in the Bible. You can go to the next one, Sharina. Okay. Um, have you ever wondered um, if we're headed to a total cashless society. Maybe you've noticed more and more, and we've been talking a lot about this, that more businesses are only accepting digital payments. So what's the deal with the, all this cashless society hype? And are coins and money going away? It says, are cash coins going away for, for good? And does a cashless society really look all that different than the world we live in right now? It, it, yeah, it does. It looks different. Um, as we get further on into this, you'll see why I say that. Um, a cashless society is one where all physical money, cash and coins, is going to be totally replaced by digital currency. In a cashless society, you can't spend or save paper dollars. 
because they aren't accepted as payments. And the money in your bank account only exists in digital form. No driving through ATMs to withdraw a fresh stack of Andrew Jackson's. Mm -hmm. The only way to pay for stuff in a cashless society is through digital transfers. Um, these transfers can be done with debit cards, debit or credit cards through digital wallets. Think Cash App, Zelle, PayPal, Google, Venmo, and Apple Pay. Those are the things that they're talking about. And you might be thinking, wait, don't we already have a cashless society now? Well, yeah, sort of. Cash is still king in some places. But because the convenience factor, a lot of people choose to make their everyday purchases with a card or through an app. Think about it. Unless you're a hardcore stickler for using the tried and true envelope system, when was the last time you actually pulled out a wad of cash to pay for anything? The Pew Research shows that in a typical week, at least 41% of Americans make absolutely zero purchases through using cash. Mm -hmm. And that's not all, all that surprisingly, though, because when you think about it, think about all of your transactions now, your banking and some of us even order food online from Walmart or other places and have it delivered to home. And we don't even leave our homes for the most part. We are using our credit cards, our debit cards to do that. Um, a lot of us swipe our debit cards to pay for everything and have wallets stuffed, stuffed to the brim with receipts, um, gift cards and gum wrappers, but no cash. A true cashless society is a way is way different than that. It is a world where cash doesn't exist at all in any physical form. No one is paid under the table anymore, and every transaction you make is traceable. A cashless society runs totally on government-backed digital currency. And that's something else we're going to get a little bit in um, further, because this is not going to be some people see this as a good thing, and in some respects it is. But in some respects, to see how deep the government gets into our lives, we think Big Brother is watching us when we are walking down the street or listening on our phones. Big Brother gets into our lives, and they are, at some point, will try and run our lives. And we are giving them access to it. They already have access, though. And while no societies are 100% cashless at the moment, there are some countries like Sweden and China appear to be headed that way. In Revelation 13, 16 through 18, he says, he causes all both small and great, rich and poor, free and slave to receive a mark on the right hand of their foreheads and that no one may buy or sell except one who has the mark or the name of the beast, or the number of his name. Here, here is wisdom. Let him who has understanding calculate the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man. His number is 666. This well-known prophecy foresees a global banking system that requires some personal ID incorporating allegiance to the beast from the sea. Revelation 13.1. In order to access a personal bank account, clearly such total control would only be in an all-digital cashless society. But many see a danger when you pay digitally. You always leave a digital footprint. And this footprint is easily monitored by financial institutions. We see that every day. We can go and do a search on the internet for, for say some shoes. We can do that in a search bar, but if we go to any other website, we'll see them shoes that we researched on another okay. site there. I mean, they, they are tracking us. We do leave footprints all over the internet. And this footprint is easily monitored by financial institutions. Many don't like details of their transactions, products purchased, payments, amounts, and payment location, times of payments, being available to unknown businesses, but they're out there and they are tracking us. But nevertheless, 
this banking system is coming soon. So welcome to the surveillance society. And according to the book of Revelations, it seems that despite such harsh control and loss of financial privacy, many will accept the mark with all its claimed conveniences. That's how they're going to get a lot of people. But a relatively few will refuse the mark and pay with their lives. Revelations 13, 15. It appears that the Antichrist hold all the cards, so to speak. But we'll see a little bit more about that later. Okay. Okay. We see the um, smart cards, the rapid move toward a, um, a cashless society. The 1980s saw the early forms of cashless trading with the introduction of a magnetic strip. Remember back then, we first got our little credit cards. We had that little strip that runs around uh, uh, on the back of it. But we still see some of them on the cards today. This period saw the development of the debit-based transactions using electronic transfers at POCs. That's the point of sales. That's the EFT POS. That's the abbreviation for the electronic transfers at the point of sales. Even then, it was foreseen that smart cards, cards with an embedded chip, would replace a simple magnetic strip card. And today, chip and pin are widespread. Now, I wanted to explain a little bit uh, about what a chip and pin is. A chip and pin card is a type of credit card that requires the cardholder to authorize transactions by entering their personal identification number, which is your PIN number, much like we do with our debit cards, and that the chip and PIN card are less susceptible to fraud than the previous generations of credit cards. Now, I say that to say this. They said it's less susceptible to fraud, but we see nowadays that it almost doesn't matter what kind of card they put out there, whatever security they think they have embedded in those cards. We know that there are um, black markets that can get a hold to anything that they want to right now. So in essence, if they're trying to save us the hassles or the headaches of our cards being stolen electronically, it's just not working and it's not going to work because people are evil out there and there's a lot of evil in this world. People do it just because. The cashless society is born COVID has accelerated smart card payments since they can be contactless, which after COVID, everything became contact. You couldn't contact nothing. You couldn't do anything. Um, and that's why people started buying foods over the internet, um, uh, having stuff delivered. And they have it where you don't even have to interact with the people that's delivering your food. They can leave it outside on your porch. But we know that Walmart has a system now where you pay a little extra money they can have, you can have the, the person that delivers your food to be, bring it into your living room. You can tell them, no, I want them to take it into my kitchen, but you have to give them access to your house. You have to be there for the most part to get that. But you also, there is a system where if you have a garage, you can set up a pin number for them at for that one time only to, to put your food inside your garage. So they're, they're getting into, they're getting us used to all of these different things right now. And smart card payments have now overtaken check and cash payments. In 2019, cash transactions accounted for just 1% of Sweden's um, GPD, which is European Payment Council, and cash accounted for just 19% of all payments in the U.S. during the 2020. Americans carried an average of $73 in cash on them in 2023, so they say. I have not had $73 in my personal <laughs> payments <laughs> in a long time. Cash accounted for just 18% of all payments in the U.S. during 2022. And 37% of Americans have used virtual cards for purchases in 2023. U.S. consumers have 1.1.28 trillion in revolving debt. 
$5,733, the average credit card debt for American consumers. Wow. So we, each credit card we got, especially if they give us those high things, we have, we do everything for that credit card. Some 93% of consumers in Asia were using cashless payments. Now think about that. 93% of consumers in Asia is going cashless. So everything, just about everything they do is cashless. Um, I saw a little video where um, they had this girl, she only carried this little, about the size of a, a cell phone. And in most cases, that's the only thing they carry. They don't carry, women don't carry purses. They don't carry wallets because it's mostly a cashless. They can do everything on their cell phones. So they were using cashless payments. It is predicted that only 10% of the UK transactions will use cash in 20 by 2030. So in China, Sweden, Finland, and Estonia, already strong encourage cashless trading. And now we're going to biometrics. That This is something else that's gonna be scary. Um, biometric payments is another point of sale technology. Smart cards can be lost or stolen, and a way around this is to link a person's identity to their physical characteristic, uh, which is the biometrics. This is your face. Walking up, you see on the movies, they have these things where you, they scan your eyes, the iris. This is the biometric is, is doing your face. Biometric authentication compares data for the person's characteristics to that person's biometric, which is your template or reference model to determine resemblance, to make sure that all of your features that you are putting out there is, is what um, is supposed to be. Um, favorite biometric techniques use fingerprint recognition, facial recognition, voice recognition, and iris recognition. Now, people can change their faces. They can change, if you have a cold, or something, your voice may change a little bit. Um, I'm not sure if anybody ever messed around with changing their eyes, so their iris recognition. But these are just some of the things that eventually the biometrics will go to, or you know, at least they're moving toward that right now. Finger scanning is a popular biometric payment. A biometric payment card, or card payment, has a fingerprint sensor right on the card body. Alternatively, people can link their bank accounts to their facial biometrics in order to smile to pay. It's something to think about. Okay. That's the, the little fingerprint thing that would be on the card. That's your, that's your whole world right there. An example, India, as of 2023, India was not totally cashless society, but India has a 12 digit UIDAI number <laughs> that is good. Ex <laughs> okay. It, the, and a uh, number is a good example of the coming control, digital control. That's, it's kind of like something like an ADHAR is what they're saying. It is a 12 digit unique identification number issued to Indian citizens by the central government. And it is issued and managed by a unique identification authority, which is what that UIDAI is. And this card is essentially identification document used by that organization after it records and verifies every citizen or every resident, uh, Indian citizen detail and biometrics and demographic data. So it's your face and where you live, the areas that you're in. This number is stored in a centralized database and it's based upon an individual's demographic attributes, your name, age, your gender, and your address. And their biometric information, photograph, fingerprints, and iris pattern. So they're, they're scanning and, and they're actually just completely controlling your body as well. They have everything that they need about you. And the scary thing is that if these things go well, then that is going to come over to the United States. It's already in other countries. So, you know, once one country starts something, then it comes to the United States 
you know, it, it eventually will be here. Will we ever see it in our lifetime? We don't know, but they're heading that way. Uh, let's see. Okay, the AHAR online identity platform then enables an individual to claim government benefits and services and access services like banking and mobile phone connections. Whilst the UI DAI is currently voluntary, clearly life without it can be difficult, or I think they're going to make it difficult for people so they won't have a choice. Whilst the biometric market is projected to be worth over in U.S. dollars, $5 billion by 2025, biometrics is not without its problems. It's not 100% accurate. Facial, take facial recognition technology. It uses a complex algorithm that recognizes each person's unique facial features, characteristics, but appearances can often change, as I said a little while ago. Clearly a method of identifying a person solely by their unique number or personal ID will be less prone to error, which this is all scary when you think about it. Think about how they gather this information uh, about us. And then there's the central banking, uh, bank digital um, currencies. Banks are now planning central bank digital currencies, which is the CBDCs, with the objective of eliminating cash. And Pastor Yvonne was talking about this last week or earlier this week. I think it was last week that she was talking about this, where the cashless society. Examples of central banks are the banks of Japan, the People's Bank of China, and the German Deutsche Abundance Bank, the Bank of England in the UK Central Bank. The significant point is that the CBDCs are not cryptocurrencies and can only be used for payments, which invest, investing in them is prohibited. Put another way, a central bank controls um, a CBDC, whereas cryptocurrencies are decentralized. They can't be regulated by a single authority, such as a bank. And the CBDCs will have to be linked with digital identi identity to manage risk and secure payments. Identification is based on unique digital IDs. And the digital ID could include a person's vaccine status and would be required to access to bank accounts, social media, and internet use. It could also monitor a person's ESG scores, which is, Sharina did a thing on this, I thought, think at one time, the ESG, the environmental, social, and governance factors. Yep. Uh, this would monitor a person's use of energy, how they do that, I don't know, with the power to cut off those who use too much, if that is such a thing, which is kind of crazy when you think about it. The ultimate danger the CBDCs will enable central banks to take complete control of all personal spending, lending to an end to freedom of buying and selling. Slowly but surely. Yes. The cashless technology, and this is the RFID. The radio frequency identification is all around us. And it is found in supermarkets, um, general retailers, electronic road tolls, company badges, farming, and in your pet dog, when you get them little things put in them. You use it, <clears throat> excuse me, you use it when you use your smart car for contactless tap and go payments in a supermarket. How does it work? A scanner, uh, like a card reader emits a short range radio frequency signal, which is picked up by a local, a small local RFID device. And so when the card is brought to the electromagnetic field of the reader, and in some cases, those readers are half the size of a cell phone, they can be all the way down to the size of a um, stamp that you put on an envelope. Um, the chip is the card is that it has to be powered on. And once the chip is powered on, a wireless communication protocol is initiated and established between the card and the reader for the data transfer. This could be your RFID smart card. 
or an implantable RFID tag about the size of the grain of rice. This is that little thing they're going to put in your arm or wherever they're going to put them. The passive receiving device is energized by the scanning radiation, thereby enabling two-way data communications, usually encrypted, at least we hope it is, if this is what they're going to, between the scanner and the local device. Since it is a radio system, it operates on a specified frequency. Now, when you think about them putting, implanting something the size of a grain of rice in your body, and you got to think about radio frequencies from that little chip to wherever this RFID reader is, you know, you think about how they will totally control you and what effects that thing could have in your body at some point. That they're they're really already doing it, or yeah. they have people that have volunteered to um, to be uh, guinea pigs, for lack of better words, for that. So uh, mm -hmm. there are people walking around with that technology already embedded in their hand. Mm -hmm. And this is a picture of that thing. I mean, you think about it, it's supposed to. It is the size of a grain of rice, and you know how small. A grain of rice is and but that's what that thing looks like if you can see them there's i'm not sure what that stuff is. it's like the, the reader the information your information has to read with this uh magnetic strip in order for that information to go from your your arm or your your arm to the thing in order for them to pick up the information that they need like your credit card information for you to pay for things what and super, yes ma'am it works on a frequency, so mm -hmm. uh, it's it's even uh, later uh, technology than a magnetic strip. Mm -hmm. it works on you know like if it the the thing if your car gets close to it, it like you know like it well it's not like electricity, but it's a frequency frequency that, yeah yeah that emits mm -hmm. a certain sound that picks up the the chip, the, the grain of rice thing in your hand or. In mm -hmm. Yes. The, in supermarkets, item level deployment of the RFID um, technology allows for quick checkout that scan all products at once and thus eliminates the checks. But the sinister application of an FID, FRI, FID, RFID lies in its application to humans. Clearly, an extremely attractive buying and selling system could be to number and tag each individual and then detect their number remotely over short distances for access to their bank accounts. It is claimed that such an implant would also reduce financial fraud since ATM transactions would only be possible if a person was physically present. And you kind of wonder, you know, um, they keep saying to reduce fraud. Um, so you'd have to be physically present for um, at an ATM in order for that to happen, for a fraud to happen. But sometimes with the way things are nowadays, it's just stuff all over the world. I mean, just out in the air all over the place. So well, that is what it looks like. These crooks being cut off your hand and took your hand. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, take it off and take it to the bank, you know, because yeah. it doesn't say that you have to be alive in order for it, that to work. It just says your hand has to be close to that, oh, that piece of machine. <laughs> <laughs> Current technology uses implantable RFID chips. These low-cost chips, the size of a grain of rice or smaller, are used to tag animals and now humans. Because, you know, I used to implant the chips to keep track of your dogs, your animals, and cats. But now this is what they're doing for to us humans. For humans, a good place to implant the device is in your hand. And I see most of them, they put them like, you know, in your elk down at your wrist. I think in that area somewhere, maybe they put them there too. An early example of this technology was the very chip uh, from Applied Digital Solutions. That was the company. Its manufacturers and marketing was discontinued in 2010, possibly for technology reasons. The ability to remotely scan personal data could be 
uh, security risk. And for civil liberty reasons, there are also possible health risks. They say maybe cancer uh, and other things that could possibly have gone wrong. And that's my whole issue with it even now. Um, even back then, they was talking about in 2010 for, you know, risk. We don't know what that, those things would do to our bodies in the long run. We've got these, these waves running through the air in our hands and these things are in our bodies, you know. We don't know what that will do to us, and they don't know. But that was one of the reasons why they uh, got rid of this uh, this one uh, this technology back in 2010. Um, like they said, there was possible of cancer risk for different health issues, and says this does this align with prophecy? And Revelation 16:2 says, and a severe and malignant sore came up on the men who had the mark of the beast. The ultimate technology for a cashless society. It is interesting that RFID technology is now being developed for application to human skin. It's scary to me. Antennas for RFID tags can now be tattooed directly onto the skin surface. This form of removable surface technology appear to align better with Bible prophecy than an implantable device. Six 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 is here. When we look at all of the things that I've talked about, and there's a whole lot more out there. Clearly, given the well-tried RFID system, advanced personal IDs based on many factors, including biometrics, and a universal banking system based on the CBDCs, it is only a short technology step to the full 666 system of Revelation 13. To close on a point of detail, recall, um, Revelations 13, 16, and 17. And he uses all to be given a mark on their right hand or on their forehead. And no one will be able to buy or to sell except the ones who has the mark. Some questions whether the mark of Revelation, uh, verse, uh, Revelation 13, verse 16 is in or on the hand or the forehead. Clearly, this could have a bearing upon the financial technology employed, the final technology employed. The Greek word in question is epi, and it's normally translated. An exception is the, well, this was talking about the King James Version, um, which meant epidermis. This is talking about the skin, which means upon the skin. So the mark of revelation might include a form of a tattoo on the skin, and just discuss this technology using a removable skin tattoo for an antenna is already here. I, I was going to say that um, that the the uh, grain of rice that's old technology, and I was going to bring up the um, the tattoo um, RFID. Amen. Okay, there are many advantages of such a personal ID. Safer financial transactions, more convenient, buying and selling, automated access to buildings and medical records, etc. Most people will accept the mark and or and the associated new world order, but the Bible says they will believe a lie. In 2 Thessalonians 2:11, God will send them strong delusions that they should believe a lie because they did not believe the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. More significantly, Bible prophecy warns against accepting the mark. If anyone worships the beast and receives his mark on his forehead or on his hand, he will also drink of the wine of the wrath of God. And that's Revelation 14, verses 9 and 10.
a hope for the believers in Christ. Despite the acceleration for the Castro Society, the point in time at which the personal mark will be introduced is not clear from prophecy. Some see it being imposed by the beast from the earth, which is in Revelation 13, 11 through 18, during the seven year tribulation period. In other words, it's quite possible that true believers in Jesus Christ will not have to take the mark. I say that again. It is quite possible that true believers in Christ, in Jesus Christ, will not have to take that mark. Prophecy suggests that the true church will be taken, raptured to meet Christ in the clouds before the mark is forced upon people. Jesus said it will be like the removal of Noah from the sinful world before the flood or taken out of Lot before the judgment of sinful Sodom and Gomorrah. That's in Luke 17, 26 through 36. Looked at from the Jewish perspective, some align the rapture with the Feast of Trumpets celebrated by devout Jews. Either way, the rapid techno technological advance and the imminence of the mark also points to the imminent end of age and the return of Jesus Christ. So put your trust in Jesus and not in the mark. Okay. Uh, okay. This is a, this is a little short video because um, I know we're almost out of time. This is a little short video and I have two of them, but I think we're just going to watch this one. Um, because if we have, and if anyone has any more questions for me or Sharina, we'll get have a few minutes to be able to answer those questions. So this is a short video on uh, cashless society in the U.S. This is about the digital payment system. Did you want this one or did you want the the other one? Get, show the other one, the one that shows the pros and the cons. Uh, yeah, that one. Okay. Thank you. Welcome to Business Zone. The pros and cons of a cashless society. A society without cash might sound like something from science fiction, but it's coming. There are already a lot of financial transactions and practices that don't involve cash, and many banks, service companies, and even governments are in favor of the change. Key takeaways. Many countries are moving toward a cashless society in which all financial transactions are done electronically. Going cashless could cut down on more than just the costs and hassles of managing money. It could also cut down on some types of crime. Going cashless means you have less privacy, are more likely to be hacked, are more dependent on technology, make economic inequality worse, and more. The use of credit and debit cards, electronic payment apps, mobile payment services, and virtual currencies could lead to a society without cash. What is a society without cash? In a cashless society, people don't use cash, like bills and coins, to pay for things. Instead, all transactions are done electronically using debit or credit cards or payment services like PayPal, Zelle, Venmo, and Apple Pay. Many countries are moving in this direction, but it's hard to say which ones will completely get rid of cash. Before a society can completely stop using cash, there are a number of social problems that need to be solved. The pros and cons can give you an idea of how going cashless can change money and banking as you know it. Benefits of a cashless society Those who have the technology to take advantage of a cashless society will probably find it easier. As long as you have your card or phone, you can get to all the cash you have right away. The main benefit isn't just that it's easy. Here are some more good things. When you carry cash, thieves can easily take advantage of you. Once a thief takes your money and puts it in his or her own wallet, 
it will be hard to find it or prove that it's yours. In one study, American and German researchers found that crime dropped by 9.8% in Missouri after the state switched from giving cash welfare benefits to giving EBT cards. Automatic Paper Trails In the same way, there should be less financial crime in a cashless society. Most illegal activities, like gambling or selling drugs, are done with cash so there is no record of the transaction and the money is easier to clean. If the source of the money is always clear, it is much harder to launder money. When there is a record of every payment you get, it is harder to hide income and avoid paying taxes. Cash management costs Getting rid of cash is more than just convenient. Printing bills and making coins costs money. Businesses need a place to store cash, a way to get more cash when they run out, a place to deposit cash when they have too much cash on hand, and, in some cases, a safe way to move cash from one place to another. Banks hire big security teams to protect their branches from bank robberies that happen in person. In a cashless future, people might not have to move money around or protect large amounts of cash, which would save them time and money. Ease in international payments. When you travel, you might need to change your dollars into the currency of the place you're going. But if you're traveling in a country that accepts cashless transactions, you don't need to worry about how much local currency you'll need to withdraw. Instead, everything is taken care of by your mobile device. Disadvantages of a cashless society Getting rid of cash might cause more problems than it solves, depending on how you look at it. Here are some of the biggest problems with a system that doesn't use cash. Digital transactions give up privacy. Cash payments are more private than electronic payments. You might trust the organizations that handle your data, and you might not have anything to hide. But the more information you put online, the more likely it is that it will get into the wrong hands. Cash lets you spend money and get money without being seen. Hacking risks are present in cashless transactions. Hackers are like thieves and muggers in the digital world. When there is no cash, hackers can get more information about you. If you are a target and someone empties your bank account, you might not have any other ways to spend your money. Even if federal law protects you, it will still be hard to get your finances back on track after a breach. Technology problems could make it harder for you to get money. Bugs, power outages, and simple mistakes can also make it hard to buy what you need when you need it. In the same way, when systems break down, merchants can't take payments. Even a simple thing like a dead phone battery could, in a way, leave you penniless. Inequality in the economy could get worse. If nothing is done to help them, the poor and people who don't have bank accounts will probably have an even harder time in a cashless society. If buying things with a smartphone becomes the norm, for example, people who can't afford them will be left behind. The UK is trying out contactless ways to give money to charities and homeless people, but these methods may not be good enough to replace cash donations just yet. With that the video is wrapped. If you like the content, then please subscribe to this channel. See you in the okay. next video. All right. Um, do Does anybody have any questions uh, of me or Sister Sharina? And thank you, uh, Serena, for the, the videos, or the slides, the presentation. You guys well, when I look at when I look at that video, I say we are being conditioned and not even realizing it for the cash of society. Mm -hmm. Most of us are using that. Yes, because very few people, when you think about it, very few people actually really carry any large amount of cash in their pockets nowadays. Right. <laughs> <laughs> well, most of us I ain't got large amount. Um, <laughs> Yeah. They were talking about the average person carries seventy three dollars. I'm like, I'm lucky if I got three dollars in my purse. Yeah. <laughs> most of us are what you can. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Oh, shoot. Yeah, they're paying with your phone and that, you know, basically but but a lot of us are doing that now already. Mm-hmm. Yes. When I lived in China, I rarely had cash. Mm. And I never, like, 
I pay with if you didn't have your phone, like most people didn't take cash. If you tried to give them cash, they probably wouldn't even take it. <laughs> it's it was exclusively done with um by paying with your phone. Mm -hmm. That's common. Everybody here. had these little QR codes that they would scan. Even people that like even because I lived in like a, the, a rural area. So people that were like selling um like their produce, like farmers and things like that, that you would expect them to be using cash, but not had their little QR codes. Yeah. Because they even over there, they still, even like the little vendors, they have the little street vendors where you buy food. Most yeah. of them don't even take cash. No. They have that little, those cards little or that little thing mm -hmm. that you were talking about. Yeah. Hey, Serena, overseas, are they, are they that in uh, U.S. dollars? Or Say that again? What, what kind of money were you using? Were you using... Oh, no, I was using... Uh yeah, their 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 money. I didn't. They don't have well, probably very. They use still use in the yen system, right? Yes, I wasn't. I didn't make U.S. dollars. Right. I mean, I could. Um, you could go to, it, actually in order to um change over to American dollars. It was a process. It's not an easy. <laughs> thing to try to um exchange it, it was it's a whole process to exchange your chinese money over to u.s dollars so Current, when you came back to the u uh -huh. uh, i was gonna say when you came back to the u.s did you have to change all of the money that you had saved up over there to u.s money yes oh okay uh, yeah hmm. and and that's yeah. another reason they're going to be pushing the Catholic society. They're going to say you just have to have one currency wherever you go. You ask, you know, you know, you don't, you don't have to use cash, so you just use no currency. digital money. Mm -hmm. you have. Yeah, There's not going to be any currency. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because they're going to get rid of. I mean, you're going a lot of places now. They don't deal with coins and change. You know, it's it's just going to be strictly cards. Mm -hmm. You know. And you have to pay a lot of fees on the different cards, don't you? Depending on how you use it. Mm hmm. Yeah, you sure do. Oh, it's it's another another thing. Yes, like in order, like getting um getting money out of China is difficult. I mean, it's not difficult, but yes, there are a lot of fees and stuff associated with it. Mm. Yeah. Okay. Does anybody else have any questions or comments? Yes, we're getting close. Yes, sir. We sure are. Very nice, ladies. It was really, really uh, uh, experience and learning. Informative, Both yes. Informative, yes. <laughs> and that's why we have Prophecy Club. Mm -hmm. well, we have probably some very nice very, very nicely done they always mm -hmm. pick very good subjects for us and and uh why why should we do this why should we study prophet prophecy and prophetic prophetic topics it's because the bible says so mm -hmm. and we want to be well informed and not caught off guard so that's why we do it yes. my topic wasn't really prophetic but it is it was um based around the end times and how we have to use our discernment about certain things and um mm -hmm. yeah i just i yeah about discernment mm -hmm. well it was a little prophetic in the sense of watered the word of god said in the last days the gospel would be watered down yeah that's that's one of the most watered down way of preaching the gospel you can go it's chosen that you know yeah. yeah, and I guess about like false, um, false, false teaching. teaching and false. Mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, yeah, I thought that was a really it was a it was a great subject, um, because it kind of opened your eyes. I'm glad I never really looked at it, but they was talking about a Christmas show on there too. I I don't, I just barely did hear about the chosen, 
But I never yeah. even heard about a Christmas show that they had made either. Yeah, I didn't know there's, about that one. There's, mm -hmm. there's one coming out, The Road to Bethlehem in November, and they were already talking about how, because Lecrae's in it. Hmm. And Who is Lecrae? Art, Lecrae's, um, he's a, oh, a, a popular oh, okay. rapper. Oh. He's called a Gates. Christian rapper, right? Yes. Yeah. Oh, that's that's a. Hmm. And they're all the same. <laughs> like they have Joe flirting. And... What'd you say, Denise? I couldn't hear you. They have um, where Joseph is flirting and where Mary's really upset. Oh. And, oh. Yeah, and that's supposed to be the Thanksgiving movie that's coming out. Oh my goodness! Mm. Yeah. And that's why the church has no power. Today, because we're so watered down, as the one guy called them, the coffee shop churches now, you know, and people are leaving the coffee shop churches like never before. You know? Yes. Okay. They, okay. Can't see any, they don't see a real difference between the world and the church there now. You know? Yes. It's because the, the scriptures are not entertaining enough for us. They, we, we want to be entertained Right. Like, all of the, like some drama and mm -hmm. but I, I mean the Bible is entertaining and well not only that it's entertaining but it, I, it is I, exciting and mm -hmm. it's if people just read it yes it can be life changing it doesn't always have to be it's instructional mm -hmm. <laughs> or it's, it's but it's guide it's exciting it's not yes it yeah. is instructional but it's not just one way like there, there are I, entertaining things and exciting things in the yes. bible mm -hmm. also they're taking it at surface and not they're not looking at it with uh spiritual eyes so it won't be entertaining to them right 